Hey, we're glad you're connecting with Journey Church Online. We hope you'll find this message to be relevant to your life in the real world. If you want to worship through music played by the Journey Church Band, check out our worship playlist available 24-7 on our YouTube channel, Journey Church Roanoke. We'd love to help you take the next step in your spiritual journey. If you'd like to learn more about our church, you can find details in the description below this video. Thanks for joining us. Blessed are those who run to Him, who place their hope and confidence in Jesus. He won't forsake them. Blessed are those who seek His face, who bend their knee and fix their gaze on Jesus. They won't be shaken. Come on and pray.
Hey everybody, what do you spend much of your time thinking about? What takes up a lot of your energy and attention? What do you worry about more than you want to admit? For many people, one thing is near the top of the list of how they'd answer those questions. Do you know what it is? Yep, money. Just mentioning that word, money, can lead some people to start being anxious. Why is that? What does it say about us when any talk about money in the church leads many of us to want to check out mentally? Is it because we're already handling money in such a great way that we don't think the Christian faith has anything to say to us about the topic of money that will improve our lives? Or is it because the way we're handling money isn't what the Christian faith says will lead to the best life possible, but we don't want to believe that or accept that because it would mean making some changes that we don't want to make. When we're struggling financially, because we have all these bills to pay, because we have more expenses than income, the whole idea of following the teaching of Scripture and being generous just doesn't seem to compute in our minds. On some level, we may agree that being generous is a fundamental principle of Christian spirituality, but we find it so very hard, if not impossible, to do, because that would require we turn away from our continual consumption and to begin to live simpler lifestyles. And up front, we just don't want to do that we may have started the journey of faith in following Jesus, and we may have had the intention to give, but we get caught up in the fear that if we were to become generous, we'd not have enough left over for what we want, and so the giving thing just doesn't happen. That's what was taking place in the lives of the Christians in the church in Corinth to whom the Apostle Paul wrote a letter. He wanted them to get this spiritual principle. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. That's a godly principle you can trust. If you sow sparingly, if you give sparingly, that's what you're going to end up reaping. Paul is saying, what you choose to keep for yourself will be all you'll have. But what you choose to generously give away in faith, God will multiply. If you invest only in yourself, all you'll be left with is yourself. But if you invest in the way of Jesus, 
that will be multiplied in a way that blesses so many, including yourself, but not solely or mainly yourself. If you approach money from the perspective, everything I have is from me and for me, that view will lead you to spend basically only on yourself. And you'll not give in a way that will bless the lives of others through the power of Christ's love because selfishness is the opposite of love. True love always gives. I know people who have the attitude that when they finally have more money, then they're going to give more money and become more generous. But that's not what usually happens. Having more money won't automatically make any of us more generous. In fact, having more money doesn't normally lead people to become more generous. Having more money just more clearly reveals how self-focused we already are when we keep money to ourselves. Having more money doesn't change our hearts. Giving or failing to give money exposes what's already the condition of our hearts. If we're not generous now, the likelihood is that we'll not be generous in the future unless we intentionally plead with God to do a renovation of our selfish hearts and open our hearts to that actually taking place. Jesus taught, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Say that with me. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We may say that, but how many of us in actuality agree with that? Let's be real. What do the giving patterns of most people who say they are Jesus followers truly reveal about their hearts? Do you think of yourself as having a Jesus-like heart and as being generous financially? The Generosity Commission has done research on giving. Do you want to guess what percentage of Americans they found self-identify as being generous. They found that 74%, or essentially three out of every four Americans, consider themselves to be generous. Okay, the biblical benchmark for giving is a tithe or 10%. Well, to what degree do the giving practices of people who say they are Christ followers actually demonstrate giving that percentage? What percentage of Christ followers who say they've committed their lives to Jesus actually give 10% of their income to Christ's body, the church? Do you want to guess? Is it 100%? Is it 90%? Is it 80%? Is it 70%? Is it less than that? Vanco, the financial services company, found that the reality is 5% of Christians tithe or give 10% of their income to Christ's body, the church. Yep, 5%. That means that 19 out of 20 Christians do not tithe or give 10% of their income. What does that expose about the condition of our hearts? What does that say about how actually generous we are, regardless of how generous we say we are? And men, this next finding has something to say in particular about our hearts. Women make up three out of four donors. Men make up one out of four donors. Here's another question. How many households are there in which the women faithfully give, but the men give basically nothing? What do you think, men? Okay, well, 
if only 5% of people who say they're Christians tithe or give 10% of their income, what percentage of their income do they actually give? Is it 8%? Is it 6%? Is it 4%? 80% give just 2% of their income. What does keeping 98% of our income for ourselves reveal about how actually generous we are, regardless of how generous we say we are. Okay, well, do any faithful Christ followers who have genuinely generous hearts ever give more than 10%? 77% of people who do tithe give more than 10%. That means that over three out of every four people who do tithe give 10% of their income to God's church and also give an offering of more than that. When it comes to money, four giving categories have been identified. Tippers give sporadically or to a specific need. Givers, somewhat regular contributors. Investors, give faithfully to accomplish Christ's mission, stewards live a lifestyle of generosity. Be honest. In which of those categories would you put yourself? Okay, if you were honest with yourself about that, because you don't need to be honest with God about that, because God already knows. What will it take? for you to take one step forward to increase in your generosity simply because you've experienced the love of God and you want to show your gratitude to God? What would it take for you to take a leap of faith in increasing in generosity in a way that would show you genuinely trust in the goodness and grace of your Heavenly Father who loves you more than you can comprehend? In the book, Holy Sweat by Jim Hansel, there's a story about trust. The story is about a father and a son. One day, the man and his son, Zach, were out hiking. As they started to climb up the side of a cliff, Zach wanted to race his dad. And he got ahead of his dad and was climbing above him. The dad suddenly heard Zach's voice from above him yell, Hey, dad, catch me. The dad was totally caught off guard. He turned just in time to see Zach joyfully jumping off a rock straight toward him. The father became an instant circus act and caught Zach in mid-air as he was coming down. Fortunately, they had just begun climbing, so it wasn't that far to the ground. So when they both landed, neither was seriously hurt. At first, The dad couldn't talk. When he finally found his voice, he gasped in exasperation, Zach, can you give me one good reason why you did that? Zach, with remarkable calmness, responded, Sure, because you're my dad. Zach didn't think it was a big deal because he believed his father could be trusted to care for him. Do you believe that your Heavenly Father can be trusted to care for you? Do you believe you can trust the way you handle money to your Heavenly Father enough to take the leap of faith in starting to be generous? As you saw in the video, we who are Jesus' followers give from our hearts. We give so that the poor may be clothed and the hungry may be fed. And in doing so, our faith may be made stronger. We give so that others may hear about Jesus and experience His love and compassion. If we genuinely have Jesus-like hearts and we've known the goodness and grace of God in our lives, why is it that we worry so much and don't give much? Is it because we think we don't have enough? It's hard for us to admit, but in our materialistic, consumeristic culture, money can become our God. And we can start to believe that greed is good 
Because we buy the lie that money will buy us the good life. Jesus has a strong warning about this approach to life. There was a time when someone tried to get Jesus involved in a family conflict over money. Then he said, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Followers of Jesus are not to give in to greed. We're not to fall into the trap of greedily wanting more and more and more, more things, more experiences, more anything that keeps us from being giving. That's not how the meaning of a Jesus-like life is measured. The value of your life isn't measured by the cost of your house or car, by how fashionable your clothes are, by how new your tech is, by how frequently you eat out, by how many sports activities you're involved in, by how many concerts you go to or cruises or vacations you go on. When those become the focus of our lives, they can become counterfeit gods and they become a barrier to our living a generous life sold out to Christ because we're more concerned with getting and doing what we want, though we certainly never even consider the possibility that we're greedy. Money will never provide us with real peace. Money will never provide us with a sense of real significance. Money will never purchase us real security. We may buy into the lie that money will provide us with those things. But God is the only one who can truly provide those things regardless of our net worth. Once Jesus asked his disciples, who did they think he was? Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self. How many of us, if we're really honest, would admit that at least to some degree, we're interested in the things of God for what we can get out of God. Jesus says that is to misunderstand. Jesus says that being his disciple is about denying yourself not about getting more stuff for yourself. It's about putting others before yourself. It's not all about yourself. Now, you may be like, deny myself? That's not what I'm into. Put others before myself? That's not what I'm into. If I really believe that stuff, I would be generous, but I'm not. I'm really not. Jesus asks a penetrating question that cuts right to the heart when we selfishly handle the money God has entrusted to us to steward in godly ways. And be clear, that's all the money we have because all things on earth ultimately belong to God because God created all that is. Jesus asks, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self. Wow. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Let's dive a little deeper. The Greek word here translated as lose or forfeit literally can mean to ruin, to render useless, to destroy. Jesus is saying, whether you realize it or not, when you're greedy and not generous, you're ruining your own life. You're rendering your own life useless. You're destroying your own life. That's what greed does. 
It ruins. It renders useless. It destroys. Maybe not immediately, but over time, that's the consequence. Now, I've wondered about how honest to be with you as we talk about money. You see, I know lots of people believe that when pastors talk about tithing and generosity, it's really all about a money grab. It's so pastors can be paid bigger bucks. And you may believe that about me. But I know my heart. My heart is that I want God's best for you. I don't want a bunch of stuff for me. I know lots of people grumble when there's any talk about money in the church. I can't control that. But because I truly love you, I will point you to what Scripture says. The Apostle Paul writes, giving grows out of the heart. Otherwise, you've reluctantly grumbled yes because you felt you had to or because you couldn't say no, but this isn't the way God wants it. For we know that God loves a cheerful giver. Giving grows out of the heart. Generosity grows out of the heart. It is a heart matter. It shows what kind of heart you do have for God or you don't have. When it comes to giving, motive matters. If we give with the expectation of God giving us something in return, we're not being selflessly generous. We're just actually engaged in a selfish transaction. We're giving because we think we'll get something out of it. Dallas Willard, known as one of the most spiritually deep theologians of our generation, wrote, The most important thing in your life is not what you do. It's who you become. That's what you will take into eternity. Being a generous giver is an identity decision. It reveals the person you are and are becoming. So, I want to challenge you to consider, do you like where your life is headed? Do you like the direction your life is going in? Is the life you want a life in which you're desperately clinging with closed hands to what you think is all yours? And you want to give away as little as possible, if any at all, and with those closed hands, you're closing yourself off to the blessing of God. Or is the life you want a life in which you live with open hands, giving generously, and with those same open hands, you're opening yourself up to the blessing of God? Which is it going to be? You get to decide. I invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes and listen for a few moments as music plays and ponder and pray about what it is God is saying to you in this very moment.
We're so very glad that you have been a part of this worship experience of Journey Church. We truly believe that God wants the very best life possible for us, for every aspect of our being, whether it be physical, emotional, mental, spiritual. And we want to encourage you to live a life that brings you joy, that's found in living in the way of Jesus, which includes giving all of who you are to Him and being generous of the finances in which God has entrusted you so that you may bless the lives of other people. If you would like to contribute financially, we invite you to go to our website, journeyconnection.com, click on the link there that says for giving, and you can contribute whatever percentage you believe is the next step for you to become more generous. And when you give, you not only enable the ministries of our church in reaching out to children, youth, and adults. During this season, we're involved in a Renew campaign in which repair work is being done to the building we recently purchased that had some damage prior to our buying it. We encourage you to be generous in your giving and to make a difference. And if you want to know if your giving really does impact lives, take a few moments and listen to this testimony shared by Jackie Taylor, our associate pastor, of someone who was baptized. Thank you. Before I trusted Jesus, I felt like I was in a never-ending downward spiral. Darkness was overtaking my life. I wanted to die and felt that was the only way to find relief. I knew there had to be a better way. At my weakest, I turned to prayer and asked for help. A friend of mine led me to Journey Church and I felt hope for the first time in years. Since deciding to trust in Jesus, I now know that I am not alone in my struggles. I know that Jesus suffered way more than I ever have or ever will. It has opened my spiritual eyes and I see things as positive no matter what I am going through. I still struggle. But I know I have comfort in the love of Jesus and that my faith in Him is all I need.